How are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, There is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. God is good. And all the time, whenever you feel alone that everyone has abandoned you, read Psalm 3. Listen to the first three verses again. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. When people call you a hopeless case. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. God is good. Come on. God is good. And all the time. Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome those of you watching online, wherever you are. I wish I could see you physically. I have to satisfy myself with seeing you by faith. I hope you're being blessed by God's word. I particularly welcome those of you online who are not Seventh-day Adventists. May the Lord superabundantly bless your lives. And to my little brothers and little sisters who are watching, may God bless you, bless you, bless you. For those of you seated right in before me, I th and who are not Seventh-day Adventists, thank you very much for coming. Let me ask, is there anyone now, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, you have come absolutely for the first time. May I see your hand? First time. Where's the hand? First time. Ah, God bless you. God bless you. Any hands over here? Where is it? Ah, God bless you. God bless you. Let me pray for visitors in the building and for visitors online. Father in heaven, thank you for your wide, wide sweeping love. It covers sinners and saints. Father, I present to you our guests. They've come to worship with us in person and online. I ask you, dear Father, as an expression of your pleasure with their choice, bless them. Bless them not only today, bless them tomorrow, bless them the day after. And as long as they live, let them remember the spiritual joy of having fellowship with us. If they have children, Put a double blessing on their children, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject for this evening, a rule without exception. Have you ever heard the saying, there's an exception to every rule? You've heard that? You haven't? You've heard it? Okay. Well, our subject is a rule with no exception. What is the first thing I'll ask you to do? Now, don't disappoint me this way. The internet is watching you. What's the first thing I ask you to do of three things? If you're not using this, if you're using it, turn it down. All right. Favor number two, what's that? This side, stay quiet. Favor number two, what's favor number two? <laughs> and what will you say? Lord, put your words. If that my, now, any side, any row, what verse do I usually use? Jeremiah, chapter 1. Somebody say it. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. God knows I want to speak his words. Favor number three. What's that? 
What's the first I usually use? And what's the first part of that say? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, I wrap my arms around the foot of the cross and I'm not letting go. You have to pull me away and I know you won't. As the blood of your son drips on my head, have mercy and forgive if I've offended. God, the task before me requires divine help. I am not divine. You must help me. It's not a command. It's a statement of fact. I believe with the little faith I have that you will help. Not for my sake, but that your name may be glorified. And those whom you love blessed. Help me to present the message with simplicity to God. Because simplicity produces power. Bless those listening wherever they are online or in this building. A special blessing on all our guests and a sweet blessing on the little boys and girls. Father, when this message is over, let decisions be made to live according to the standard of righteousness. Bless this country. Bless the leaders. Bless all countries connected now on the internet. Let them make decisions to follow you, Father, at every level of society. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's go to Genesis 1. It is 16 minutes or 17 minutes to 5. I'll release you on or before 5.30. Genesis 1, we'll read verse six, uh, 26. Remember also to pray for my sister. She's doing a very, very important work. And as far as I'm concerned, she and I are working as one under the direction of the Spirit of God. And so remind me to slow down when I get excited. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? Read with me. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness stop. We are introduced to the image of God. Now, go to Genesis 5 and we'll read verse 3. Our subject, what is it? A rule without exception. Genesis 5, we'll read verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. Quiz question for you, how many images do we have now? Two. But in how many images did God make Adam? One. Whose image? His. Not the image in chapter 5. That is not God's image. Tell me why. Sin. Listen carefully. If you get nothing else, get this. There is no sin in the image of God. Not even a microscopic sin. In the image of God, the instant Adam sinned, he no longer reflected the fullness of the image of God. He now developed his own image, which really is the image of Satan. Because sin did not begin with Adam, it began with Satan. And there is no difference between Satan and a sinner. The only difference is Satan has more power to do wrong than the human sinner. That's why Jesus said, Ye are of your father, the devil. Like father, like son. Two images. What is the purpose of the gospel? What's one of the purposes of the gospel? To return us to which image? Image one. Now listen to me carefully. It's very simple. The purpose or one of the purposes of the gospel is to return fallen mankind to image one. Question for you, how many sins were in image one? None. Then the purpose of the gospel is to produce in us what? Look at 
Listen again. Remember favor number three. The first image was sinless. It still is. Adam developed his own image because he sinned. Now, we have an image without sin, Genesis 1, 26. We have an image with sin, Genesis 5, 3. The purpose of the gospel, or one of its purposes, is to restore us to image one, which is the same thing as saying, is to restore us to what? Sinlessness. Listen to the word again. Sinlessness. Because we live in a world where we see sin everywhere, including the church, it is difficult for Christians to believe that a child of God can be brought to the point of sinlessness. Here's how merciful God is. If a child of God commits a sin in ignorance, that sin does not count. Nobody said amen. Must be my fault. Let me try again. God does not hold ignorant sins against us. This is mercy. And so if you are on the path to sinlessness and you commit an ignorant sin, it does not change your state because an ignorant exception. Jeremiah, what is the nickname given to Jeremiah? The weeping prophet, yes. What's the nickname given to Isaiah? The gospel prophet, he talked so much about Jesus. Do you have Jeremiah? Chapter 2, verse 5. Is it up there? Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? What's the answer? None. Thank you, whoever you are. God is asking Israel, what iniquity did your fathers find in me? And the answer is none. Go to John 8. We read 44, 45, 46. You have John 8. Not yet. That's still Jeremiah 2.5, I think. If you bring your Bibles, we can get it long before it comes up there. Don't let a screen ever take the place of a Bible. Nobody said amen. <laughs> I'll never forget this when I get back home. I'll tell people Nigerians are very nice people, but they never answer you. That's what I'll say. All right. <laughs> Do you have John 8 now? Do you have from verse 44? Read with me, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Now 46, and because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Now read verse 46 with me. Which of you, come on, convinceth me of sin? None of them. What is Christ saying about himself? I am sinless. Go to John 14. John 14. Let's read verse 3030. Not 13, 30. You have it? Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh. Finish that part. And hath nothing in me. What is Christ saying? I am sinless. Jeremiah 2.5. God says. What iniquity have your fathers found in me? John 8.46. Jesus says. Which of you convinceth me of sin? No one. Listen to me carefully. The life Christ lived on this earth is the life required of us. You may say, well, Christ was sinless in heaven. Yes, he was. How can a human being live a sinless life like a God? Christ came down, took your nature 
in his fallen condition, conquered sin, and he tells you, if you connect to me, this life will be yours. Now, there's something called righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith is the central teaching of the Bible. It is what God does for the sinner to save the sinner from the condemnation of the law. Righteousness by faith. Give me a simple word for righteousness. Right doing. Right doing. What's our subject? Right doing how often? How often? All the time. There is no exception to the rule of right doing. Not in the eyes of God. You don't take a break from doing what's right. Go to Psalm 106. Our subject, a rule without exception. Ten minutes to uh, five. A rule without exception. Do you have Psalm 106? Verse three. When it's up there, just say amen. Blessed are they that keep judgment. And he that doeth righteousness, finish the verse, at all, meaning there is no, think of our subject, there is no exception. Because an exception to righteousness is what? Sin. And God cannot permit that. An exception to righteousness is sin. Now, consider this. There are 168 hours in the week. 168. Let us say we sleep seven hours a day, seven days a week. How many hours are those? All mathematicians tell me quickly. 49. Take 49 from 168. What do you have left? But don't take all evening. 119. Am I right? You take 149, one, take 49 from 168, what do you have? 119. All right, so we have 119 hours left. Three of those are spent in church. So we have 116 left. Which means we spend more time in secular activities than in holy activities. But God requires us to be righteous, how often? At all times. Which means, now you must concentrate on what I'm about to say. For the genuine Christian, there's no such thing as secular time. Now you say, what do you mean, Mr. Extremist? Listen to this. If it is done for the glory of God, is it holy or secular? It's holy. In a certain sense, it's holy. Now, listen to the rule to which there's no exception. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or play a game of soccer or take an exam or run a business or pursue a romantic relationship, finish the verse. Do all. What's our subject? <laughs> a rule without exception. This requirement that we do everything for God's glory has no exception. And I mean no exception. Someone may say, well, that man is a fanatic. Yes, I am. Let me tell you what I mean. Here are two opposites. Sin, what's the other one? Righteousness. Now, you cannot get two wider opposites than sin and righteousness Put a person to sin, who would you put? Satan, put a person to righteousness, whom do you put? Jesus Christ, two opposites. Where does Christ live? Where is Satan? Well, let's say hell, okay, for the purpose of this message. Two opposites. Then the person who pursues a righteous life will look like an extremist to someone who lives a sinful life. Listen to the Lord's Prayer. Well, say it with me. Come on. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. If you and I live by heaven's standards, earth will despise us. 
Do you know why Cain killed Abel? The Bible tells us. Go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3. Let's read 11 and 12 of 1 John 3. Our subject, a rule without exception, five minutes to five. For those online who think someone is timing me, no one is. I just like to keep time to let you know I am aware of your time and will not waste it or go beyond. What book did I say? First John. What chapter? Three. What verses? 11 and 12. Is it up there? Read with me. What does that say for? Heard from the beginning that we should love one another this is the message we heard from the beginning we should love one another 12 not as cain come on who was of that wicked one stop who's the wicked one no 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 who's the wicked one satan the bible says cain was of that wicked one what does that mean he was a child of the devil right outside the gates of eden it does not take sin long to develop. Who was of that wicked one and did what? Slew his brother now. And wherefore slew he him? King James language. Finish the verse. Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. We have two opposites and they are so opposed to each other. The outcome is murder. And that has not changed. That is why we know from prophecy in the last days there will be a death decree against those who finally decide to live a righteous life. There will be a death decree. Sin's response to righteousness has always been, will always be a murder. And that is most frighteningly demonstrated on the cross. But even though we live in a world that has a murderous hatred for righteousness, God calls upon us, whether therefore ye eat or drink or raise children, run a business, pastor a church, be an ambassador for a country, do all to the glory of God. My brothers and sisters, when God called Israel, go to Genesis 19, not Genesis, sorry, Exodus 19 as quickly as well, as quickly as they can get it up there. We read from verse 4 to 5 of Genesis 19. Let me pray again. Father, as I continue a rule without exception, speak through me clearly and help me to say what you tell me to say and not what I think sounds good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remember to tell me slow down for my sister's sake and your sake and the sake of those listening. Exodus 19, reading from verse 4. Read with me. He have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, next verse. And ye shall be unto me what? A kingdom of and a holy. Stop. What is a holy nation? What is a holy nation? Now, a holy nation keeps the Sabbath. Are you with me? So you have one day, a holy day, one out of seven, okay? The holy nation keeps that Sabbath day, and the holy nation is holy on the Sabbath. Does God need a holy nation on Tuesday? Does he need a holy nation on Thursday? Does he need a holy nation on Wednesday? What is a holy nation? A holy nation refers to people who are holy seven days a week. How many hours? 24 hours a day, even in their sleep. I was in a certain country, and two men came for counseling. They were businessmen. They sold a certain product in their business. So they came for prayer. And I said, is this business committed to God? And they said, well, not formally. I said, are you Christians? They said, yes. This business 
must be committed to God. So it is his business and you work for him. This is not symbolic language. I told them, when someone enters your premises, your first question should not be, I wonder if I can make a sale. Your first view must not be a view of a customer. Your first question must be, I wonder if this person knows Jesus. And even if the person does not buy anything, when the person leaves, the person must leave with the impression, I have dealt with an honest Christian businessman. Can you say amen? That's priority one. Because religion and business are the same thing. You're asking me to explain it. If you do righteousness at all times, Psalm 106 verse 3, everything you do becomes an expression of your religion. In other words, here's how a Christian plays soccer. Doesn't cheat. If he does a foul, he owns up to it. He doesn't foul you and then look innocent as a goose. Are you with me? How does a Christian be a policeman? How does a Christian be a politician? Everything you and I do must be an expression of our religion, which is the religion of righteousness. What's our subject? A rule without exception. Now, it has benefits for you. When you commit your business to God and your life, God takes over. You ask me, here you are, here's God. Who is better able to run a business? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I told you there are benefits for you. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We'll read verse 8, our subject, a rule without exception. I hope my friends online are still with us. My little boys and girls. By the way, I really enjoy my little friends who come every night. God bless you, my little brothers and little sisters. I'm always happy to see you. Keep coming, please. And one day, you'll be the one standing here while I am in the grave or someplace like that. What book did I say? First Timothy. What chapter? Four, what verse? Eight. Is it up there? Read with me. For bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness, which is another word for righteousness, keep reading, is profitable unto stop. When you run a business, what are you trying to turn over or to produce? Profit. Mm -hmm. no, not even a Christian starts a business to fail. That's not of God. God is not a God of failure. God's a God of success. Godliness is profitable unto in other words, applying righteousness to whatever you do is a benefit. Keep reading. Having promise of the life that now is, keep reading, and of the life, come on, to come. Which means right doing has benefits in this life and the benefits continue right into the world to come. Dishonesty may have earthly benefits, but they end in the flames of hell. Corruption may seem to get you a bigger house. It will go down in the flames of hell. Bribes may get you a nicer car. It will burn in the flames of hell unless there's a change. But because we're intelligent, we think ahead. If my strategy only goes this far, let me adopt a strategy that takes me into eternity. What is that strategy? Right doing, godliness, righteousness. How often? At all times. Godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of the life that is to come. How many of you have a business? Can I see your hand? You have a business. You run a business? Come on, raise your hand. You run your oh, hands down. Let me pray. Father, tell me precisely what to tell your people who run businesses. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every, what's your currency, your smallest coin? What's it called? A what? Have you ever heard of a penny? A 
I, I don't understand what you're saying. Okay. Have you ever heard of a penny? All right. Let's call it a penny. Every penny of profit should come with a clear conscience. Because the people you're robbing, God loves. And God is watching you. Let me say it again. If you run a business, every penny of profit should come with a clear conscience. Because the way you run your business must be evangelistic. Let me tell you why. Go to Isaiah 43. Read verse 7. Why should it be evangelistic where we already have a clue from 1 Corinthians 10.31? Let us go to Isaiah 43 verse 7. Our subject, a rule without exception. Why should your business be evangelistic? You have Isaiah 43 verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name. For I have created him. Come on. For my glory. No, that's fine. I have created him for my glory. And dishonesty in business does not glorify God. When Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Did Jesus teach honesty, yes or no? Honesty is best taught by example, not by talking. So when Christ said teaching them, it doesn't only mean teach them about the Sabbath and about tithe and about vegetarian food. Teach them to be honest. Because their Savior was one in whom could not, found, could not be found one sin. Those of you who run businesses, make sure your business glorifies God. Because your customers are those for whom Jesus shed his blood. Do not put profit over salvation. Because if you do, one day, you, your profit, and your business will burn. This is no joke. This is biblical truth. A rule with no exception. Let me be a little more outlandish and ridiculous in quotation marks. Whether therefore ye eat or drink of whatsoever ye do. Now, think of the word whatsoever. What is excluded? Nothing. What's included? Everything. Now, let me see. Should I tell you what I'm about, what I'm thinking? Should I tell you? The Lord has not yet. Uh, you look so young. I don't know if I should tell you. Whether they for do all to the glory of God. Uh, I don't know if you can take it. All right, let me take a risk. I'll try to be as gentle as I can. Do all, tell me, to the glory, come on. Does that include husband and wife in the bedroom? We live in a world where Christians go to the internet to find. And they take it into the Christian bedroom and make demands one of another that cause the angels to. What's our subject? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or enjoy marital relationship. Finish the verse. Do all to the glory of God. Now, go ahead and call me a fanatic. I'm listening. You're not calling me, you're calling Christ. Let me tell you why we must adopt this attitude of microscopic integrity. What kind of integrity? Micro, let's shorten it to micro-integrity. 
Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Quickly. Well, as quickly as they put it up. 2 Peter 3. Why am I pr pr promoting micro-integrity? Let's read verse 13 of 2 Peter 3. When you have it and you're ready, say amen. Read with me nice and loud. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth. Finish the verse. Wherein dwelleth, that's it. In the new world, everything is done right. But this life is a rehearsal for the life to come. You missed it. You don't wait until you get to heaven to practice righteousness. You practice it here so that you're fit to enter there. Every four years, we have the Olympics. You know, we have some African nations that just cannot be beaten in long distance running like the Ethiopians and the Kenyans. You just can't beat them in these long races. You think they practice only for two weeks in the four-year span? They practice all the time for the Olympics. You don't practice basketball to enter 10,000 meters running. Are you with me? You practice for 10,000 meters. Now, we are preparing for a world where everything is done how? Right. How can you practice sin in preparation for a sinless world? Let me leave the business people alone. I hope you'll make changes because of this message. How many of you have boyfriends and girlfriends? Can I see your hands? Come on, raise your hands. You know it. Oh, come on, raise your hand. God is watching. Okay, hands down. Hands down. Calm down. <laughs> I have a question for you. Are you ready? No, you're not ready. You're still talking. I'll wait till you calm down. Here's the question to the ladies who have boyfriends. Ladies, can I see your hands again? Okay. You're nervous now, so you didn't raise it a second time. Okay, okay, okay. Are they Seventh-day Adventists? What did you say? Did everybody say yes? No, okay. We have an honest unbeliever. Okay. <laughs> the Bible says... Whether therefore ye eat, come on, or drink, or have a boyfriend. Finish the verse. Do all. Now, the same Bible says, be not unequally yoked together, come on, with unbelievers. And so, my lovely sister who needs to repent, I don't know where you are, get rid of him tonight. What's the joke? Get rid of him tonight. You have fax. You have email. You have Skype. You have Snapchat. You have Facebook. You have Instagram or Instagram. You have Twitter, which is now X. You have all the, you have a loud voice to shout to the next village. Tell him it's done. Don't discuss it. Announce it. If you discuss it, he'll act as though he's dying and your maternal instincts will kick in. Are you see, you see what I'm saying? You'll try to save him. Let Jesus save him. I'm not joking. Now for those of you men who are looking cool and smug, let me get to you. Are your girlfriends Adventist? Huh? Men, you have big voices and I hear nothing. I don't care what size hips she has or the flavor of her lips. Get rid of her. When? Tonight. What's the best time to do what's right? Now. I've never quoted from Ellen White since we began. I don't think I have. But let me quote now. 
Are you ready? Take a deep breath. Adventist Home, page 67, paragraph 1. Everything has to be done to God's glory. You have it? Adventist Home, page 67, paragraph 1. Listen carefully and remember these are not my words, so keep your weapons holstered. To connect with an unbeliever is to place yourself on Satan's ground. You grieve the Spirit of God and forfeit His protection. What does forfeit His protection mean? You give it up. The Bible says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? You're supposed to be light, the unbeliever, darkness, in the context of what you believe. Now, where is Paul quoting from? Listen, don't go, just listen. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. From creation, we have a lesson built in. Light and darkness should not coexist. Paul uses that and he says, what fellowship or what communion hath light with darkness? You read Exodus 34, verse 16. Fifteen, sixteen. They will turn your heart from me. No, no, Deuteronomy 7, verses 2 to 4. Same thing. Not you will turn them to me. They will turn your heart from me. There's something very popular among us which is not biblical. It's called boyfriend evangelism. Girlfriend evangelism. So I can win him even though he's not a believer. No, no, no. There's no biblical basis for that. Whether therefore you eat or drink or conduct a relationship, it must be done according to God's glory. What's our subject? A rule without exception. You're taking an exam. It's the last one you need to complete your degree. And the professor accidentally left the answer sheet on your desk. Hmm? You didn't ask for it. He left it. Whether therefore you eat or drink or take an exam. Finish the verse. Do all to the glory of God. You're applying for a visa. <laughs> and an embassy requires a financial statement of your assets. And you submit the assets of your grandfather and your cousin, but not yours. Whether therefore you eat or drink or apply for a visa. Come on, finish it. Do all to the glory of God. Now I know you don't like me. <laughs> My brethren, I'm smiling, but this is very serious. Do you know one little sin is the reason why the world was cursed? <laughs> what was the sin? He consumed a fruit. And perhaps just one bite of a fruit. Perhaps my favorite fruit, banana. And God said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of that banana, cursed is the ground for thy sake, the entire earth was cursed for one little sin. Then what's the Bible telling us? There's no such thing as a little sin. Because anything that produces death cannot be little. What's the wages of sin? Which sin? Any sin. In Nigeria or United States, if you steal a grape, the wages is not death. Are you with me? In God's system, you steal a grape and you never confess. Finish my words. Death. Because sin is so destructive. Sin is like a rust spot on your car. You have a Lamborghini. Some expensive car that costs half a million dollars. 
and gives you 54 gallons to the mile. <laughs> you see a rust spot. Do you wait until it becomes large as a silver dollar? No. You take care of it immediately because you know if you don't, it will spread. You have a house. You just built. Beautiful house. Lawns. And one day you're coming home, you see one termite. You know what termites do to buildings? You see one termite. Do you say, ah, that's just one termite. You call the exterminator. I don't know what you call him in Nigeria. You call the exterminator and he comes, he goes under your roof, your foundation, and sprays and puts to death every termite. Because one termite can start problems. My brothers and sisters, it's 20 after 5. One termite of sin can ruin your life. We need to live by this principle. There is a rule without exception. What is that rule? Whether therefore he eat or drink or whatsoever he do. Finish it. Do all. Because you were made for the glory of God. Isaiah 43 verse 7. I have created him for my glory. I'll give you one final verse and I sit down. Let's go to the most popular chapter in the entire Bible. I believe it is. The Shepherd's Psalm. Psalm 23. Say it with me. Are you, you ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Stop. Careful now. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Your right doing on mine is for God's sake. Your obedience is for God's sake. What we forget is that Satan accused God of having a law that is unfair and cannot be kept. When we disobey that law, Satan see, see, I was right. When we obey, God says, see, I was right. Whom will we support? God. By being what? Obedient. Practicing righteousness. Let me tell you again. There's a controversy between Christ and Satan. Every time I sin, I support Satan's argument. When I do what is right, I support God's argument. I told you earlier, one of the reasons for the gospel was to bring us back to the way Adam was before he sinned. A higher purpose for the gospel is to finally prove to the universe that God has always been right. And sin, turn wrong. When we obey, when we do what's right, it's not us. God is glorified. God benefits. So your righteous behavior, your perfect life, your sinless life, first is for the glory of God. Because his name has been besmirched. Satan has spat on God's name, thrown dirt on God's name, and our righteous life helps to restore God's image in a certain sense. And so it's not for you, first of all. It's for God. When you and I understand we're on this world for God's sake, it changes how we do what we do. God, God, God. I tell people all the time when I counsel them, whenever you've got a decision to make, and I'm going to let you go, ask two questions first. Listen carefully. Let me pray. Father, as I come to the close, give me simple wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Two questions. One, how will God be glorified? Question one. Question two, how will others be blessed if I take this step? You know why? Look at the Ten Commandments. The first four express love for whom? The next six, love for whom? Man, which one expresses love for you? Which one calls you to love yourself? None. It's love for God? Love for your fellow man? Mm-hmm. So if you decide, I want to be healthy, yes, so you can serve your fellow man and glorify God more effectively. Are you following me? In other words, you think of God and you think of your fellow man. That's it. Now that's heavenly living. It's strange on the earth. 
So you may say, shouldn't I go to school? Of course go to school. The more qualified you are, the more effectively you serve God and man. That's the heavenly lifestyle. Say it with me one more time. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye, or, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. When all those persons came this morning to recommit their lives to God, it was done to the glory of God. And during the week ahead, when I make calls for baptism and you come, it will be for the glory of God. Always remember, that, is this for the glory of God? Christ died for the glory of God. Daniel went to the lion's den for the glory of God. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, better known of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were willing to go into the flaming fire for the glory of God. Joseph in Egypt, a woman tried to get him to sleep with her. He said no. He went to jail for being innocent for the glory of God. We must be willing to die for the glory of God. How many of you will say with me, Father, having heard this message, help me in all I do to practice righteousness. Can I see your hand at all times? Stand up with me. Righteousness beginning when? Now. Ladies with non-Adventist boyfriends, get rid of them. Men with non-Adventist girlfriends, tell me, get rid of them. Now, now, now let me say this quickly. If you're married, don't get rid of him. Are you with me? Don't get rid of her or him. I am talking to single people who are on the way to getting into trouble. Get rid of them tonight and tell me about it tomorrow. Are you with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you today, God, that as our heavenly father, you have set a high standard for us out of love. The same way earthly parents set high standards for their children. Your standard is your character. Your standard is your righteousness. Your standard is your holiness. Father, it is almost impossible to grasp the reality that you give human beings divine standards to live by. That is because you think so much of us. It is all possible through Jesus Christ who became one of us and lived up to that divine standard. Father, put into us a love for right doing just because it is right, whether it is convenient or profitable, just because it is right. Give us that mindset. That's the way Jesus was. Now as we leave, Father, with great seriousness, I ask you to give courage to those young people in mixed relationships that they may break them off. They will never regret it. Give them the courage to do it. Now watch over us tonight. Bring us back tomorrow. Bless Nigeria, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow. The Lord willing.